Hello, I'm David Reeves, and this is the Genesis Science Report. Tonight, we will talk with an expert to get the facts about the environmental regrowth that has taken place at Mount St. Helens. We're also taking viewer questions who are tackling the subject of the Ice Age. We'll also give you an important ministry update on how we've reached millions in the past few months. But first, how would you like to meet this thing when you're out for a swim? A group of scientists from Singapore have discovered a deep sea isopod with 14 legs that measured 20 inches long. And I dare say he's intimidating. While its habitat and behavior are likely to be similar to other isopods, we don't yet know what makes this particular species special, except for its head that reminds some people of a movie villain's helmet. That's right, it's been dubbed the Darth Vader cockroach. And it was dredged up along with thousands of other bottom-dwelling creatures off the edge of the continental shelf west of Indonesia. But what is it? Well, deep below the surface of the ocean lives a pill bug, or rather an isopod, which is something like a gigantic version of a pill bug or a wood louse. Like the garden variety bugs, marine isopods have many sections on their armored bodies and lots of legs. And also like them, they will eat anything, especially helping clean up dead leftovers as decomposers. And there are varieties of these creatures in nearly every zone on the planet, with around 10,000 species having been identified. That's just so far. Now you may think this is photoshopped, but it's not. Instead, it's an example of the gigantism that we find in the deep ocean. In cold, dark, high-pressure waters, large creatures like this can thrive. And thrive they do, able to live for long periods without eating, waiting for something to show up in the water up to a mile below the surface. Now, although this variety just got its official name, Bathinimus raxasa, similar isopods have been kept in captivity, and they've been known to survive for up to five years without eating. I guess what I find fascinating is that other than its size, it's not so different from the many other isopods that have already been found. They're a type of an arthropod, and another type of arthropod, which is now extinct, as far as we know, but also lived in the deep oceans, was called the trilobite. These creatures are usually found as fossils in the deepest, lowest strata layers, and are thought to be some of the first life forms to ever evolve, yet they are just as incredibly complex, unique, and functional as this Darth Vader bug. You see, as a Christian, I would suggest that these creatures were all created by God in the beginning as fully formed kinds of animals, and they're amazing examples of the creativity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Most of my colleagues agree with me that universal common descent, also known as classical Darwinian evolution, is an antiquated and a failing theory held by the radical left atheists who also believe that the mass murder of innocent young people is okay, because after all, we're only animals, right? Do you buy that? And now for the comment corner. Michael says, God bless you for your wonderful work in proclaiming God's word as truth from the very beginning and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Michael, for that. It's what we try to do every day on Genesis Science Network, on our various media outlets, on Trinity Broadcasting Network, um, literally everything we do. One more from Jessica who wrote, I use your videos to teach my children and also learn more myself. My kids have only been exposed to what the school tells them and not the word of God in science and creation. Your show has been so helpful in showing them the other side. We read the Bible and go to church, but seeing the facts and the proof makes what we read more real. I get pushback from my kids, but I show them a video and they say, wow, so there's proof. Thank you for this help in guiding my children to God and everlasting life. Praying God continues to bless you and your ministry. Thank you for that. That is such an encouragement. You know, today our young people are almost spoon-fed an atheistic agenda. If they pick up a dinosaur book, millions of years ago these things happened by chance. If they turn on television, they're going to see all of this atheistic dogma pushed their way when they go to school. It's early as kindergarten, when they go to high school, when they go off to college, they're going to be confronted with these theories of Darwinian evolution, the idea that we're nothing special, we're just animals, the result of millions of years of natural selection, time and chance. And that's what our ministry is all about, confronting these important issues that are leading our young people away from Christ. Which brings us to an important ministry update. 
Be sure to like and share this video with your friends and family and maybe even those who are not quite on the same page. We're always kind to those who respectfully disagree. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, David Reeves Ministries. Please go right now to our website, davidreeves.com to sign up for email updates on breaking science discoveries. We've got a huge presence on Facebook and also a free bi-monthly biblical science magazine that you can get delivered to your home free of charge. Just visit davidreeves.com slash magazine. In only a matter of months, we've received more than a million and a half views on our TikTok channel. <laughs> That's the new platform that kids are raving about. And yet, it's being used in a powerful way for Christ. That's not to say that the new platform won't be shut down tomorrow due to its covert ties with China, but a lot of truth has gone out already. And I've spoken with atheists and agnostics and some Christians. The vast majority of them using this platform are 13 to 30 years old, who have let us know that our presence as the fresh face of creation science is a welcome change. Sadly, so many of the older people and organizations in this line of ministry have made their living by condemning, by making fun of, turning off the skeptic. Well, that kind of behavior is sure to get some support because it panders to a certain devoted audience, but it's not very likely to do much to further the Great Commission. We're reaching those who are on the fence, those who are not Christians, those who need to hear the message of hope and encouragement, who need to know that they are wonderfully made not accidents or animals or star stuff. They need to know they have a savior. We're speaking towards the real issues each week. We talk about teen suicide. We talk about the rampant atheism, the gender identity crisis, veteran suicide, the radical left agenda that is so often anti-biblical, anti-life, anti-freedom of speech, anti-Christian. These are important issues that are seriously affecting our culture, our country, and not only this generation, but generations to come. Talk about rapid growth. In just 13 years, we've become the largest creation media ministry in the world, and we continue weekly to help millions of Christians back up their faith with unshakable evidence and to challenge these unbelievers to question the pseudoscience of Darwinian evolution that is so rampant in so many communities today. We want to get the truth out. As a nonprofit, we exist because of God's calling on our lives and your prayers and support. All of our ministry outreaches are designed to educate, encourage, and uplift while pointing back to Christ. Consider becoming a monthly donor right now. Your tax-deductible donations allow us to continue this work. If you've learned something and you want to expand this material's reach, just visit davidreeves.com give or call 931-212-7990 to pledge your support today. This week's question comes from Clyde, submitted by email. Clyde says, I thoroughly enjoy your program. Like you, I'm a creationist believer. The question I have is this, if the earth is approximately 6,000 years old, where then does the ice age fall? Evolutionists say that the ice age was millions or billions of years ago. Thank you for your program and keep spreading the word. Well, Clyde, uh, it's an excellent question. The ice age uh, is a question that I get a lot. And we have to remember that just because the atheistic scientific community dates the Ice Age to tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, and they'll put multiple Ice Ages happening in succession, that's not necessarily the truth on the dating. There was an Ice Age. The Ice Age took place shortly after the global flood of Noah's day. You see, the global flood of Noah's day uh, heated up the oceans. Uh, warmer oceans uh, caused a lot of evaporation. With all of the volcanic and tectonic activity that was going on at the time of the flood, there were volcanic aerosols in the upper atmosphere. Those volcanic aerosols were creating this blanket that kept the sunlight out. Now all of a sudden you have warm waters creating evaporation. Uh, it's coming down in the form of rain and snow. The sun can't melt the snow. And so what is happening is an ice age is developing day by day, week by week. So we believe the, the ice age took place a few hundred years after the flood, probably went on for several hundred years uh, before melting occurred and things returned to normal. Around the equators, things wouldn't have been so terribly cold, but uh, the ice age was real. This is where creatures like woolly mammoths would have thrived. Uh, and it is an important key as friend and scientist Dr. Tim Cleary says, God had a plan.
because the Ice Age was creating a condition where ice caps were large around the poles, the ocean levels were dropping, which means that land bridges started connecting the continents together. So soon after Noah's Ark, around the Tower of Babel, uh, when all of the people groups began to disperse, including the animals as well, well, they had a way across to different continents. That's the reason we have kangaroos in Australia. That's the reason we have animals that are native to North America. That's the reason we have animals that are native and thriving in certain areas. They all got off the ark and they filled ecological niches all around the world. That's the question and answer for the week. Join in on the conversation by sending your questions via email, Facebook, and YouTube, and we'll try to address them in a future program. And now it's time for our featured product of the week. The Red Sea Miracle Part 2. The Red Sea Miracle Part 2 is the epic finale to my friend Tim Mahoney's documentary series, answering big questions about the Red Sea crossing and other biblical miracles. How could thousands of feet of water be parted at the Red Sea? Or was the sea merely parted by the act of wind in nature through a shallow Egyptian lake? Tim investigates these locations to see if they have a pattern of evidence matching the Bible. Uh, you can pick up this series. It's a series, The Red Sea Miracle, Part 1 and Part 2. You've got the Moses Controversy and Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus. Pick up this title and many more resources from the Creation Superstore by visiting creationsuperstore.com or calling 931-212-7990. And joining me from Idaho is Paul Taylor. Paul is the director of Strong Tower Ministries. He's led hundreds of tours to Mount St. Helens and studied the environmental regrowth that took place after its eruption in 1980. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me, David. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, Paul, you know, it's been now 40 years since the eruption of Mount St. Helens. And when it first erupted, it did a lot of damage to the surrounding area. Tell me a little bit about how extensive that damage was. Well, there's a, a lot to tell. The volcano erupted laterally. Um, you expect volcanoes basically to erupt upwards, straight up through the, uh, the crater at the top. For some reason, the pressure built up and it, it exploded sideways through the north face of the volcano. Um, that produced a huge landslide which uh, moved away from the volcano at about 150 miles per hour. And uh, then you've got a blast following that um, which was moving about 350 miles per hour. So, uh, you know, you've got the landslide coming out, filling up the valley, uh, the valley between the volcano and Johnston Ridge, about five miles away, was filled with 600 feet depth of debris. There was old growth forest all over the place that was uh, destroyed. Um, it was uh, trees were snapped from the roots and they were snapped from the roots up to 17 miles away. There was 230 square miles of forest completely destroyed. So you've got this valley filled in, you've got this destruction, you've got um, uh, a lake called Spirit Lake to the northeast of the volcano. The landslide uh, barreled into the lake, pushed all the water out of the lake. 800 feet up the uh, side of the hillside opposite and of course all the trees had already been knocked down there on that hillside because the blast had overtaken the landslide going much faster so the water went up the hills picked up a lot of trees that had been knocked down washed back down to where the landslide was before but it was it only came down 500 feet because you know the landslide had come in to push the water out the water came back down on top of the landslide so the current lake is 300 feet higher than the lake used to be that means that all the hotels and lodges and things that used to be around spirit lake are not at the bottom of the lake they are 300 feet below the bottom of the lake along with the um, uh, presumably along with the body of um, harry r truman a hotel owner who refused to evacuate at the time of the eruption Mm, that was a, a, a famous and dreadful day. Well now, especially when they looked at the plants and trees and the forests surrounding the area, experts 
claimed that it would take hundreds of years before we saw any regrowth. Yes. Is that right? Uh, one contemporary newspaper reported scientists are saying uh, up to a thousand years before anything would regrow. Um, and you can understand that because the uh, the material that had come from the mountain and then all the pumice covering it and so on. Uh, I know some people have said, well, yes, in eastern Washington, it produced bumper harvests of apples. But of course, uh, we know just basically very simple. We know simply we know that plants require uh, three main minerals. They require nitrates. They require phosphates. They re require potash. And uh, you know, you see that on the back on the uh, on the side of fertilizers, uh, garden fertilizers will have NPK numbers uh, for nitrates, phosphates, and potassium. Uh, but that's similar for potassium being K. Well. Well, the uh, volcanic material has got the phosphates and the potassium, but not the nitrates. No nitrates. So that didn't matter in eastern Washington where, thing, where the uh, material fell because there was already nitrates in the soil. So the extra minerals, the phosphates and the potash, produced the bumper crops. Close to the mountain, though, you've got everything suffocated from nitrates. No nitrates at all. So they were saying nothing's ever going to be able to grow there for a thousand years. But, of course, it did because uh, you get these uh, little plants um, – um, which are uh, legumes that produce their own nitrates. And the, the principal one in the area around uh, Mount St. Helens was the uh, alpine lupin, or sometimes known as the prairie lupin. Very small plant, just very insignificant, insignificant a couple of inches high. And uh, it's producing its own nitrates, except it isn't really. It's got nodules in its roots, which are invaded by soil bacteria called rhizobia. It's the rhizobia that makes the nitrates, so the lupin grows. Uh, when it dies, the nitrates uh, go into the soil so other plants can grow. But the rhizobia bacteria doesn't do that out of the goodness of its own heart. Uh, it's, it has uh, an advantage because it, it is able to reproduce. It's not able to reproduce without special sugar chemicals that only the lupin produces. So what I've basically just said in the last few minutes is, the rhizobia needs the lupin, the lupin needs the rhizobia, which evolved first? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, if we were to visit the Mount St. Helens today, uh, I've been there with you, taking walks through the yes. forests. Um, there literally are forests of regrowth now. That's right, and of course, one place that, uh, you know, where, where we stopped, and, uh, and you did some filming there, uh, I, I get you to stop and to look around and say you're in the middle of this wood and you buy a stream. Can you picture the place? And there's lots of different types of ferns. There's a little wooden bridge that we're standing on and uh, there are trees all around. And we say, you know, what, uh, how many centuries has this wood been here? Because it looks so old. And there's seven different types of ferns and you can see the water flowing through this little valley. And uh, of course, the, the answer is that the wood wasn't there. 40 years ago uh, mm. if you'd been there 39 years ago then you would have had all the topography but no plants and of course if you'd been there 41 years ago you'd have been floating a few hundred feet up in the air because all that area had come from the landslide all brand new material rapid regrowth and it yes. shocked many environmentalists and it still does shock them because if you go into any of the secular visitor sites uh, they are very keen on using words like surprising and shocking mm -hmm. and uh, remarkable and one of the things that i like to say is yes we are awestruck by what god did in those places but there is a sense in which we're not surprised or shocked because uh, we know what happened worldwide after the flood where there was devastation over the entire world. But the world was able to regrow and uh, must have been able to regrow pretty fast in order for Noah to be able to grow vines and uh, in order for even for the uh, the dove to have been able to pick up a, a, an, olive, uh, an olive tree branch. So um, these things happen very fast indeed after the flood. And what we've seen is that 40 years of explosive regrowth is, is showing us the plausibility of the global flood model. Yes. Now, large yes. volcanoes are known to cause real observable, I'm going to use this word, climate change, including some temperature variations. Is that a correct statement? Uh, indeed. I mean, Mount St. Helens... Um is spectacular because it happened 
in the United States in an area where even, even in 1980 TV cameras could get there quickly. Obviously, you know, there was plenty of technology even in 1980. And I was stopped at one place uh, with a, a school group once where there was a, a fridge that had been moved out of a house by a mud flow. And one of the children said, did they really have fridges in 1980? But yes, uh, there was a fair amount of technology in 1980 and lots of cameras uh, close by. You're not that far from the major cities of Seattle and Portland. That's why it's so spectacular. But in worldwide terms, it was actually a pretty small eruption. And other eruptions, um, such as Krakatoa, and uh, I've forgotten the name of the earlier one in the Indonesian area, about 1830, but those caused noticeable changes in even in global temperature. Wow. Okay. Now, I'm all about conserving our environment, protecting God's yes. creation, but what if the predictions of these doomsday environmentalists, specifically regarding our impact on the climate, is way off somehow? And what if it turns into the Green New Deal, where air travel is phased out and you can't find fuel to put in your car? What about that? Um, well, we, we don't accept that that's going to happen. And of course, the big climate change that happened in the world was at the time of the flood. I mean, that was major climate change. Uh, the sort of temperature alterations caused by uh, even these even massive volcanoes is a fraction of a degree Fahrenheit and is not really going to cause uh, major effects. Um, and of course, one of the important things we've got to remember, and this is why it's so important that as Christians, we start these things from scripture. One of the important things to remember is that after that major climate change known as the flood, after that, God says he's not going to do a major climate change again. Yes, we don't have that phrase climate change, but he did say as long as earth endures, there will be uh, springtime and fall, summer and winter. These things will always happen as long as the earth endures. So until um, the Lord chooses to end everything, that's the way that climate is going to go. And yes, there are going to be variations. Yes, there's going to be types of extreme weather. Um, but these are not things that we should be concerned about. Now, God has given us large amounts of of minerals such as coal. Uh, many of us would suppose that coal uh, was laid down not at creation but during the flood, but nevertheless it is something that God made sure was there and therefore exploiting coal even though it came at the flood rather than creation, exploiting coal is within the creation mandate. And uh, I, I agree with you when you were saying we've got to look after the world, we've got to protect it. That's because the creation mandate in Genesis, at the end of Genesis chapter 1 uh, really tells us that in having dominion over the world, we must have stewardship over it. We've got to look after it. We've got to care for it. You know, it's not right to be going around polluting it. We've got to be careful. We should be cleaning things up, doing things. But at the same time, we should be exploiting them. And there are certain environmentalists today of, a, of an anti-Christian uh, hue who would say things like let's leave all the coal in the ground no mm -hmm. that's almost blasphemous god has given us these resources for us to take dominion over and for us to use and therefore to leave them in the ground and not to exploit them not to use them is contrary to the mandate that god has given to us fascinating what you're saying is god has it all in control. He has indeed, yes. And of course, the same applies to uh, the provision of oil. So, you know, the example of do we have enough uh, gas for our cars? Yes, we have, because God has given us that. Uh, but even if it was to run out, it's it's appropriate and right for us to be using it at the moment because God has given it to us. Therefore, we should be using it. Amen to that. Thank you, Paul, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And that's it for today. Thank you for joining us on the Genesis Science Report. We'll see you next time. I'm David Reeves. Keep looking up. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God.